Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches Tonight, the must-see that's not on TV. I want to emphasize before we jump in that there is no better place than the Watchbox.com, our new website with daily updates, the best videos in the industry, and of course, high-res images, watches, and all accessories included. The best place to shop for watches, I preview these daily before you do so I can steal the best stuff. I kid, I kid. But the point is, with the updates and the constant stream of new watches coming in, even I lose track of everything that's new on the watchbox.com. So please, open a new tab, stay with us, and check it out. It pays for these pixels. Okay, jumping right in, batting practice. We open with Time to Run, our Hall of Shame, the worst of internet watch sales listings and we've got some princes oops there we go oh that's okay that seat's cheap we can buy another one why pay $21,200 for the Vacheron 82172 that I reviewed last week when you can have this one for just $600 on eBay Hmm, that's a pretty good discount. Now, all things considered, this one also gives you finger grime on the etchings and the Cote de Genève under the bridges. That's right, this watch gives you more. You can see someone stuck their finger on the engravings and then underneath the center wheel, notice another set of Cote de Genève. Oh, and check out the double regulator while you're at it. Now, it would be okay if this thing were just a joke, but they're advertising it as a Vacheron, not a, not a counterfeit, which it is. So, Hall of Shame, that one is a red letter or I should say a black letter, the same color of the grime in the movement. Now, the next watch features AP's signature Royal Oak bezel bolts uh, pointing in random unaligned directions. It's hard to get this wrong, considering these aren't screws and they have counter-threaded screws underneath them to make sure they always align. This is just attention to detail, and if they can't pass that bar, I wouldn't want to find out what's inside that case and underneath the bezel. Uh, it gets worse. It gets worse. Right there, you can see they have two out of the eight bolts facing in the right direction. And as Meatloaf undoubtedly would have said, two out of eight ain't bad. This horological horror, in contrast, gets it all wrong. Okay, um, let's just start off. Here's the description for this one on eBay. Excellent condition. Please note very minor nicks on the edge of bezel, easily polished off. Yes, maybe with a wood chipper. Uh, the bezel grain, as you can see, is pointing in the wrong direction, which just means they were so indifferent they put the thing on sideways after apparently refinishing it with sandpaper. Uh, then you can see that there are six bolts misaligned of the eight. Once again, two out of eight, not bad, but the rest of this is atrocious. You can see that Every single one of the bolts has been boogered, as if this thing were put together with another hallowed Swiss export, a Swiss army knife. And final, you can see that the bezel is lower than every single one of those bolts. So it hasn't just been refinished badly, but it's been refinished badly many times. Finally, a dial with so many fingerprints that Sherlock Holmes could probably make a bust. That's pretty close to as bad as it gets, guys. It's tough to beat that unless you just don't know what you're getting. In which case, bad photos are as offensive as damage and counterfeiting, and sometimes worse because you're being deceived. You don't know what you're getting for your thousands of dollars, and it's probably because something awful awaits and this seller knows it. This image is just as bad as it appears when I see it on Chrono. So is this a reef? finished dial or an original Vacheron. I really can't tell. It's blurry, it's distant, it's far from the lens, it's, it's just unclear. And that's particularly galling because the standard for a vintage watch, good or bad, is total disclosure. Uniquely so. Um, and just for comparison's sake, is this a pumpkin? A Doxa Sub 300? U.S. President Donald Trump? I don't know. It could be anything. It could be huge. It could be sad. The point is, it's not clear, and bad photos are the bane of watch listings in the luxury segment. Okay. Moving on, we've got possibly the worst offender of the night, because you might miss it, and I think the vendor did too. Why 2 k bugs for mechanical watches? Believe it, it happens. In the U.S., we had this commercial for the Snickers bar. It ran for a long time, it was very popular. Not going anywhere for a while? Grab a Snickers. Well, you're going to need reinforcements if this JLC Grand Memovox is in your future. 
Okay, so far, so good. It looks decent, but here's the problem. Sequential calendar that only turns in one direction, and it has a year display, which means you can't just run it all the way around through 365 or 366 days and start over. It moves only in one direction, and because the JLC version of the Kurt Claus Perpetual Calendar, an IWC invention, the JLC version has a sequential pusher, so a pusher adjuster changes the date day by day by day, meaning this watch, still indicating early in the year 2000, the watch was made in 1989, is going to have to be individually toggled about 6,500 plus times. One push for each of the days that watch has not been running. And the problem here is that people just don't wear their damn luxury watches. If it's not getting wrist time, pass it on to someone who can love it, or you wind up with this situation, because you're going to have to send this watch back to JLC, or our own Mike Michaels, who's currently training with JLC, I'm happy to say. Otherwise, you'd better swap the Snickers for an everlasting gobstopper, because you are really going to be sitting there with a box of toothpicks for quite some time. Okay, send your time to run Hall of Shame candidates to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Uh, it's it's a big world of watches online. I need some help finding the worst of the worst. I can't always find them on my first pass at Chrono and eBay. So now, thought experiment, and this is an interesting one because it was proposed to me by someone in our sales department. Is it time to reconsider? Which watch is the standard bearer and the icon for Rolex as a brand? To wit, has the Rolex Daytona surpassed the sub as the face of Rolex? I think there's a case to be made. Now, 1953 to 1988, there's no contest. For 10 of those years, the Daytona didn't even exist. The sub was the icon full stop. 1988 to 1999, the Rolex Daytona suddenly becomes relevant with the chronometer, automatic winding, screw-down crown, metal tack, Zenith era Daytona. It's suddenly on the radar. It's suddenly desirable, but it's an exotic, like a Corvette and a Chevy dealer. It's a halo product. The Suburbans and the Silverados make the money, and the same was true of the Sub and the Daytona back then. The Sub was still the bedrock. Now, 2000 to 2015, suddenly the Daytona's gaining ground. Three-day power reserve, in-house, column wheel, vertical clutch, chronograph caliber, still as desirable as ever, but now Rolex can make as many as they want. They're not constrained by Zenith's production capacity. And I think you could say at this point, they're, they're, ju they're dual pillars. You have the sub and you have the Daytona. You have your dive watch and your chronograph. Then in 2016 at Basel World, this happened. And all of a sudden, the Daytona just became incendiary. The sub was hot, no doubt, hotter than ever, but the Daytona incited an unprecedented blur of speculation and price inflation, the likes of which Rolex steel sports watches sold new out of the case had never known. So here's the thing, it brings us to the present. If you've grown up with luxury watches, come of age as a watch collector in the last 15 years, you've probably never known a world in which the Daytona wasn't as robust on the market as the sub. And if you've only come to the community in the last four or five years, chances are you think Rolex, you think Daytona. And I think if the current trends continue, if people continue to pay two, three, four thousand dollars over list for a used current gen sub, but they pay a hundred percent more for a pre-owned Daytona, of the ceramic bezel generation, then yeah, we're heading for a world where the Rolex Daytona is Rolex and the sub becomes the undercard. What do you guys think? Tell me in the live chat box because this is vexing me. I still think sub when I think Rolex, but objectively, it doesn't seem to be the case. Now, this is great. This is a question from Ivan S. He asks, what advice would you give to Shigeru LeCoultz's new CEO? Okay, so JLC has a new CEO. She came over from Van Cleef & Arpel, primarily a jewelry vendor within the Richemont companies. She focused on the Asian market for jewelry. So she has experience with Richemont, she has experience with the luxury, and she has experience with the East Asia mecca of watch dealers. All the same, a big culture shift moving to the Valley de Jeu and making principally men's watches. So I would say first, focus on the future. Take it easy on the tribute watches. We've had enough. The Geophysic, the 1931, the 1948, the tribute to Polaris, tribute to Deep Sea, and now we're on our second tribute to Polaris in 10 years this year. Take it easy because this is a strength of lower end brands. If you look at the companies that are making the most bank with vintage style tribute watches, they're not the APs, the Patek Philippe's, and the Rolexes of the world. They're the Oruses, they're the Tudors, they're the Tag Heuers. This works at the low end because it gives some recognition.
recognizable style to a guy who's not able to buy a high-end watch that succeeds on brand panache and substance. I'm not saying the low-end tributes aren't good watches. I'm just saying they pander a little bit to go for the entry-level dollar. And at the high-end, Vacheron with Les Historiques owns the ultra-luxury tribute segment. Best leave them to what they do best and not live in the shadow of the big three family member from Geneva. So here's the thing, JLC, start out by doubling your warranty period. Go from a subpar two years with a third added if you water tested the boutique to a standard five years. Just make it five years. When you're getting four to five years from AP boutique sold watches, from Breitlings and Omega, you really have to look and say, this is something we need to do. As the watchmaker's watchmaker, it's not going to drive us bankrupt, force us to put new money into R&D, focus group. It's not going to cost us anything other than a vote of confidence in our own product to offer the same warranty that Rolex offers on watches that, frankly, generally retail for a lot less money. So double the warranty and do something no one else is doing. Give an extended service warranty, because I'll say this, JLC has very reasonable prices for service of watches. I've sent in complicated chronographs. I've gotten bills for less than $1,000. I've sent in full restoration jobs and paid just over $1,500. JLC does right by you when it comes to pricing on service. But give us a three-year service warranty. When most in the industry give you one, when some give you two, give us three years because a watch coming out of the factory refreshed by the same people who built it should have the same warranty, ideally, as a new watch coming from the same factory. You don't have to do that, but give us three. Set a mark for the industry and be the first. Okay, now focus on chopping service times in half. Establish a, a flagship service center on every major continent. Ideally, in 10 years, nothing should have to go back to Switzerland for service except restorations. And also, this is something you really need to do, but you need to look at stuff that you haven't done before. Product ideas. Enough with the tributes, enough with the endless iterations of the Memovox and the Reverso. You know what would be cool? A countdown Memovox diver. Give me the digital display of the Extreme Lab 2. That technology is now five years old. Give me a settable digital alarm that I can set to the minute, because right now it's five to ten minutes on a Memovox, and that's not sufficient for a dive watch. Let me set that 60 to 1 minute countdown with a Memovox style alarm. JLC stays true to its heritage of diving alarms, its chiming watches, and it offers value and complications, something that was the hallmark of the golden era under Jerome Lambert during the 2000s. Plus, a countdown chronograph that you can program out to 60 minutes is a watch you would use all the time. Fish tacos on the grill, 4 minutes or their toast. Time before your flight takes off, time before your meeting resumes, time left in an important exam. It all works. This is where you can really innovate without charging $20,000 for a complication. Take parts you already have and offer something you've never offered. And finally, you have to really focus on Veli de Jeu heritage. Focus on building an image for the brand. Decide what JLC stands for and then drive that hard because every successful Richemont CEO, that is every Richemont CEO that's died a natural death of retirement or moved on to the board has done so by defining the brand. Georges Kern, elected to the board and then he bolted to Breitling, but for over a decade at IWC, it was the pilot's watches, the Portuguese, and then everything else. Those twin pillars propelled the brand, doubled the turnover in the first 10 years he was there. Also, you look at Jean-Marc Pontrouet with Roger Dubuis. He inherited a mess coming out of the financial crisis. What the heck was Dubuis coming out of the Carlos Diaz era of crazy looking watches with nothing coherently binding them? He decided they were gonna be the Genevois Richard Mille, and it worked. They found buyers, they found a market, and they grew their sales. And then finally, look at Jerome Lambert with JLC before he moved on to Mont Blanc. Value and complications. You could get a very complicated watch in steel without mortgaging the house. And if you wanted to go to the top of the line, you would get something no one else could do, like the Ibris Mechanica Grand Sonnerie, 
the most complicated wristwatch JLC ever made. So they could do the extreme, and they could also do the they could also do the everyday complication. And then finally, Angelo Bonatti at Panerai. What were they? They were historically driven. They only had about four or five basic case shapes for his entire reign from '97 to 2018. But they riffed on that endlessly. And the military heritage, whether revisionist heritage or real, resonated with people. They went from about 7,000 watches a year when he took them across the Y2K barrier to about 70,000 today. That's what you need to do if you want to succeed in Richemont running a watch brand. You need to define the brand. Okay, now viewer wrist shots. Dip P leads off with his Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 15202 and his Audi R8 six-speed. You are the man for buying a modern performance car with a real three-pedal manual watch ain't bad either. And check out the complimentary satin finished steel. Okay, Eduardo comes close to perfection with his gorgeous Zenith Chronomaster El Primero 410 triple calendar moon phase with white lacquer dial. And Eric of Great Lakes Watch shares his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 Commander's Watch, a lovely limited edition. This is one of my favorite modern 300 meter Seamaster editions, also with a gorgeous white lacquer dial. And finally, Richard A. takes wing with his Bremont Boeing BB-100 limited edition GMT chronograph. Send your wrist shots along with your Hall of Shame candidates to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, the good news, May 28th. You ready for this, Complications fans? You're going to have two chances to own minute repeaters for about 25 grand because that is the low estimate on two separate minute repeaters coming to auction in Hong Kong via Christie's on May 28th. Now, here's the thing. That's the good news. The bad news, depending on your perspective, might be Blancpain's unique tradition. Body Blancpain likes to make watches you might pass on to your son at his wedding. Did I say his wedding? No, I meant his bachelor party. Because this isn't the kind of heirloom that Patek Philippe had in mind. And mark my words, um, May 28th, Hong Kong auction is event entertainment on an Infinity War scale, but this feature is rated R. Now, the Blancpain Minute Repeaters, two of them, both of them are gorgeous wearable pieces until you turn over the cases. And this is the only time in memory that I can ever remember seeing an auction catalog with pixelated and censored images like the National Enquirer. That's right. Uh, this isn't some anomaly from the distant past either. These are erotic case backs. And I can't share any of my photographs of the Blancpain Basel World 2016 booth because literally half of their palatial exhibit was stuck like this. So, fun? But this is not the watch you're going to be turning over to Junior unless he's graduating post-18 or he's exceptionally mature with an incredible perspective. Um, this is R-rated entertainment, possibly triple X. If you hadn't gotten enough of that from co coverage of contemporary American politics, this is your chance. All of that said, here are four highlights with a family-friendly rated G. Imprimatur from Christie's May 28th, the Important Watches and Private Collections Auction of Hong Kong. Lot 2317, JLC Atmos 566 by Mark Newson. The JLC Atmos 566 was one of 28 made in 2010 with the blue Baccarat crystal case. It's estimated at 40,000 to 61,000, but with an original retail of 117 grand, you can see why this is a substantial discount. Now, it is my favorite Atmos. It features a sky chart, it features a zodiac chart with months. It features an equation of time. It is absolutely achingly gorgeous. And with only 28 of these made, this is something that is more than a watch. This becomes a piece of the furniture within your home. If you let it into your heart, trust me, find $40,000 to let it into your home because this is a true heirloom and one that is age appropriate for all. Now, Lot 2224, the Breguet 5287 Classique Chronograph. This is the cheapest Patek Philippe 5070 you will ever find. Why do I say that? Because the 42 millimeter Patek is powered by the same movement as this 43 millimeter Breguet. That's right. The Le Mans 2310 column wheel abouche, beautifully executed. We can go full screen with this one, guys. This is as good as it gets in high horology, but unlike the Patek, which is already an investment grade timepiece, this is a $15,000 $20,000 estimate. Solid. This is solid gold rose lathe guilloche work on the dial side beautiful on both sides immaculately hand finished inside and out 
Again, for 15,000 bucks, you're gonna be paying less than the price of a current Daytona on the secondary market, and this one is full box and papers. Lot 2414, okay, a Longa Unzona, Longa 31. You might not have heard of this one, but this is the famed Platinum Puck, the hockey puck for your wrist that came out at SIHH 2007. This is a watch that is absolutely insane because it runs for a month on one wind, but you will have to wind it with the key. So this is a watch you wind with the key that runs for a month, that's the key, and it's 46 millimeters in solid platinum with the most elaborate deployant clasp you will ever see expressly designed to prevent it from flying off your wrist. This is a watch with a constant force mechanism transferring the power from mainspring barrels with enough punch to take your eye out to a balance. So this is a gorgeous watch if you've got the wrist for it, but this is an absolute rarity amongst modern Longa. It is not a watch you see every day, and though it retails for 131 grand, this one has a low estimate of 60,000. That's better than half price and a very interesting modern Longa. Now, one more from a brand that has a far longer heritage in real terms than the 1990 to present Longa. This is Cartier, and the watch, lot 2456, is the iconic Cartier tank. This one, the Mono Pusher CPCP, CPCP was a high-end high horology Cartier collection that ran from 98 to 2008, and this one features the FP Journ THA caliber MC045, the Mono Pusher chronograph caliber, also used in the Tour 2. But this isn't the Tour 2. This is the iconic Cartier. This is the tank. This is one of a hundred of these made. And this is as good as it gets because the watch is only estimated at 11,000 to 19,000. And there's no way you're getting anywhere near this kind of watch with a brand this iconic and a movement with that kind of pedigree for under 20 grand new. So moving on from an absolute bargain with pedigree, two pedigrees, F.P. Journe and Cartier, we have one with brand pedigree, Vacheron Constantin, the Malt Perpetual, this is a perpetual calendar chronograph. It's reference 47112, estimated between 20,000 and 30,000. If you pick this up for 20,000, just consider this, if that Breguet was the cheapest Patek Philippe 5070 you'll find, this is the cheapest Patek Philippe 5970 that you'll find, and platinum to boot. 39 millimeters in platinum. This one is a perpetual calendar chronograph with that same glorious Le Magne 2310 that was used in the 5970 and the Breguet that we just saw. Again, 39 millimeters, this is a wearable watch with sexy Vacheron style lugs and stepped case. Plus, it has a hinged Hunter case back, so they're not shorting you the platinum while still giving you a display back. It's the famous melancholy moon phase, hand engraved, attention to detail is rich with this one, and if you saw Colin Farrell in the Miami Vice movie, you'll recognize this watch from his wrist. Okay. One form of pop culture to the next. Rory S. from Australia asks, Tim, do you ever associate certain watches with certain types of music? Not only do I, but I think you know where I'm going with this. Okay, here with my favorite heavy metal albums and watches to suit each one, and why. Okay, starting from the beginning of the genre, Secret Treaties, 1974, The Blue Oyster Cult pioneering, influential, bedrock of rock type source material. This was the very beginning. This was heavy metal before heavy metal was a thing. The band itself is a contemporary of Black Sabbath, still touring. I saw them last year and they were awesome. Uh, this album might have been their best. Their third album, their third studio album, it features irreverence in the song Career of Evil. It features Irony, the song ME262, sung from the German's perspective by a rock band of Jewish guys from Long Island, and it features the Paranormal, which would become a signature of the Blue Oyster Cult in Astronomy and Flaming Telepaths. Uh, I can also say all of it required a level of cultural and historical literacy and wit beyond the norm in the music industry then and now. By the way, if you still doubt that this was metal, Astronomy, possibly the track from the album was later covered superbly by Metallica. And I associate, because these guys are smarter, more inventive, more literate, and innovative than what came after. Uh, they're plank owners of an entire heavy metal genre, and Secret Treaties was a huge part of that. Right from the same era, this was 1974. I'm choosing the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 5402, the A-Series from 1972, the first run from Gerald Genta's mind 
this is a watch that's a contemporary of the album and perfectly embodies everything that was pioneering, avant-garde, and ultimately hugely influential by the BOC and Audemars Piguet for that matter. Now, moving on, 1980 Blizzard of Oz, Ozzy Osbourne. As close as real metal ever became to pure pop music, this album is laden with two features that set it apart from what came after and what came before. The first is that Ozzy's generation was infatuated with Beatles-style pop melodies, and the Wunderkind 23-year-old guitarist Randy Rhodes brought soaring neoclassical guitar work to the album that would be a staple of 80s hard rock and metal. The bridge between 60s Britpop and 80s shred guitar remains almost unique, which is really what makes this album. It's a shockingly accomplished 39.5 minutes of music, and the ultimate compliment, aside from its enduring relevance and popularity, might be that the songs don't blur together. 80s metal had a tendency to all sound the same at its worst. I can safely say that Crazy Train, Goodbye to Romance, and the guitar instrumental, acoustic guitar instrumental D, do not sound the same. Every track is explosive, melodic, sincere, and utterly devoid of the period cliches that dated and overburdened subsequent corporate pop metal hybrids like Poison, Twisted Sister, and Whitesnake. You'll get none of that here. Uh, Blizzard of Oz the classically trained Randy Rhodes both saved Ozzy's solo career and spawned an army of emulators who hoped to profit from his revolutionary style. I would say alongside Eddie Van Halen and largely on the strength of this album, uh, Randy Rhodes became the most influential rock guitarist of the 1980s. Now, Randy was a little guy, full of energy, life, a virtuoso, and the force behind this masterpiece. So I choose for the watch to accompany Blizzard of Oz, the 2004 JLC Reverso Tourbillon Skeleton. This was a series of 35 pieces entirely skeletonized with a tourbillon visible from both sides. And note that the sapphires, instead of being synthetic rubies, the pivots are synthetic blued sapphires. By the way, that's from Amanico, the moderator of the Purist Pro Forum on Watch Pro Site. I recommend you check out his photo essays. Okay, Master of Puppets, Metallica, 1986. Even Megadeth partisans and grunge devotees acknowledge this opus. Master of Puppets has it all. Songcraft, musicianship, heavy metal themes, Cthulhu references, both clean and distorted heavy metal runs, songs and is instrumental, and coherence across all eight tracks. Uh, the Thing That Should Not Be is an effective love letter to love craft that works even if you're not familiar with the inspiration. Master of Puppets and the Brooding Orion demonstrate the musical range of the band. I would say that this has to be the Dark Side of the Moon for Metalheads, uh, the third and some say final real Metallica album. Uh, it deserves to be associated with something groundbreaking, bar-raising, timeless, something in contention to be called the best of its kind, and one of the best of all time. So the 1999 Alango Unzona Datagraph, that's right, the original heavy metal for your wrist that shook the industry and will never lose its gravitas. Uh, and for good measure, Metallica, reportedly fans of the proto-metal group Sack and that just fits too perfectly with a watch made in Saxony. Okay, uh, that just, the Langa analogy is complete. Okay, finally, Orgasmatron by Motorhead, 1986, a few months after Master of Puppets came out, much less successful commercially, but my favorite. Uh, beaten to the market by Master of Puppets, it didn't really matter because Lemmy and his crew were playing to a different crowd and from a different inspiration. It was out of step with the time and not a commercial success like Puppets. Uh, the thrash metal of Metallica was at least a generation removed from what Motorhead played, which was a combination of Lemmy's influences. So, punk early heavy metal, hard rock, and the same Beatles-inflected fascination with melody that drove Ozzy on Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman. Why? Because they were the same generation, and they listened to the same Beatles songs when they were getting into music. So the songs are didactic but potent. Orgasmatron slams ideologies, political, religious, you name it. Death forever decries the cult of war. And Dr. Rock is courtship without subtlety. 1950s and 1960s pop formats still hold sway. As most of the songs are substantially less, if you average them out, than four minutes. Uh, but all the same, 
This is in an era when bands were starting to compose metal symphonies. Uh, the raw one-pass sound of this recording was consistent with Lemmy's desire to spend minimal time in the studio and play rock and roll, as he called it, without genre and without concern. So the IWC Big Pilots Watch 5002 matches this album perfectly. It's as loud, as brash, as heavy as Orgasmatron, and like the album in its day, the 5002 was somewhat shocking and raw. Uh, I will say that the scale of the thing, the elemental military look, and the overpowering effect of the 46 millimeter case in 2002 made the 5002 a watch that Lemmy, a noted collector of Luftwaffe memorabilia, probably would have appreciated and worn. Like the album, The Big Pilot has remained relevant long after many suspected its novelty value would wear thin. It has staying power. Okay, best article of the week, Crushing Cartier is the topic, and quite literally, because the title of the article is Cartier owner destroys more than 400 million British pounds of watches in two years, quite literally destroying excess inventory. I like to pull the best article of the week from people, events, and product in the industry. This qualifies as events by Zoe Wood of Britain's The Guardian newspaper, off the beaten track of watch journalism. Rare insight into the sheer scope, value, and the brands involved in the Richemont inventory buyback of the last two years. Unsold inventory bought back, melted down, and destroyed. Richemont, it should be noted, made this a tactic to drive up resale prices and help their retailers, basically by constraining supply retroactively. And Richemont is the luxury group that is most invested in watches other than Swatch. Remember, they're not making their money off of Birkin bags. Richemont is mostly watches these days. So Richemont's massive inventory bear buybacks in the Far East were one of the most watched and discussed phenomena of 2017 um, as the watch industry struggled to regain relevance after the 2015 to 2016 market apocalypse. It had a colossal impact the buybacks did on profitability for Richemont, but the accepted wisdom had been that most of the buybacks were related to Cartier inventory and jewelry at retailers in the Far Eastern markets. Now this article, by Zoe Wood expands the scope of this into 2018 and also into the realm of actual watch brands that only make watches. So to quote directly from Wood's articles, it was worried that unsold stock would end up being discounted in the so-called gray market of unauthorized resellers, damaging the image and pricing power of the brands. The watches are dismantled and recycled with the most recent stockpile stemming from specialist watchmakers divisions, including the brands such as Piaget, IWC, and Vacheron Constantin. This time around, the watches are being bought back from stores in European markets, unquote. Given Richemont's enormous investments in brand boutiques, far more than Swatch, for example, which gets about 25% of 20 to 25 percent of its revenues from company stores, Richemont gets over 50 percent of its revenues from stores that are owned by Richemont. That means that Many of these pieces likely were pulled straight out of the cases at factory stores with the intent to destroy. Moreover, this article is a quick read and a worthwhile one for anyone who wants insight into how a luxury group really operates at the dollars and cents level without emotion. Critically, the article cites sources who largely endorse the practice. Given the logic behind Richemont's move, the conclusion of the article is that this is good business, and this will ultimately help Richemont as well as its tenant brands. So... Although it's difficult for those of us with a weak stomach and a love for the emotional value of these watches to see this done, it is good business by Richemont, and that's ultimately where this article concludes. Viewer wrist shots. Okay, Clive W. is a man after my own heart with his BMC road machine, uh, road bike par excellence from a Swiss brand, and Rolex Explorer 1. Stephen from the U.K., has survived the royal wedding thanks to his tank tough collection of Casio G-Shocks and one Frogman. And Shamal D leaves us with this parting shot of his classical Zenith El Primero. Send your wrist shots as well as candidates for the Time to Run Hall of Shamers to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Don't forget to comment in the boxes below if you're watching this recorded. Subscribe to our channel and follow me at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Thanks again. I'm Tim. This is Watchbox Studios. They're the crew. Time out. Tim out. And thanks for logging on.